Well, good evening, everyone. I had a bit of a moment of panic on Friday because on Thursday I wrote the first draft for the Q&A night tonight. Well, then when I went on Friday to look up and pull that document up, I looked for October Q&A night and I opened the document and it was completely different, different questions. I was like, is this my imagination? Did I lose the file? Did I delete it on accident and transfer it somewhere else or save it under the wrong name? And then I realized what happened was I pulled up October Q&A night from 2015. <laughs> and that's when I realized this is the one year anniversary of Q&A night. I just could not believe that. I had a couple people uh, tell me that tonight. I can't believe it's been, been a year already. But I say that to say thank you, because there are some projects that preachers try to roll out and they're just absolutely disastrous and we just kind of pretend like we never started them <laughs> and walk away awkwardly hoping everyone will forget. But not the case with this. This has been very successful and that is because of your questions. That is because of your interest in God's word. I know there's um, always some shame maybe, especially cultural shame perhaps, about asking questions like you're dumb or something if you ask a question. And I'm grateful that you all have been able to cut through that. And uh, just remember, questions are a sign of interest not idiocy. Remember that. And you all have shown great interest and great encouragement to me uh, throughout uh, the... Oh, is that not working? Okay. <laughs> Got the back one, not this one. <clears throat> you need a couple minutes or are you just waiting for it to turn on? I don't know if it will turn on, so I'll get it in Okay, okay. Well, we're working on it. <clears throat> well, let's then save time and go ahead and get into the lesson as we talk about the difference between John's baptism and Jesus's baptism. In other words, the baptism of John versus baptism into Christ. So I guess we don't want to save too much time. We're still waiting. <laughs> oh, you got it. Okay. I guess I'll take a second for the color to come. All the way through. Looks a little dark. <clears throat> okay. John's baptism versus Jesus' baptism. What, what's the difference uh, between those two? And secondly, were those who were baptized by John re-baptized into, into Jesus at, at Pentecost and after to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? So that's really the two parts to this question. I want to break them down into... It's into the various parts. Boy, this light is too dim. I've got to turn this up. <clears throat> okay. Just to note, that's happened a couple times. So children, if you're playing in that area, if you happen to see that light switch, if you could just let it alone. I know it might could get accidentally bumped, but then I get up here and it's completely dark and I can't see my, my notes. So this is much better. Um, John's baptism versus Jesus's baptism. Turn to Mark chapter 1. That's where we're going to start. Mark chapter 1, uh, verses 7 and 8. Mark chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Here John actually tells us the distinction between the two. In Mark 1, verses 7 and 8, John the Baptist was preaching and saying, After me one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So here John provides the main distinction. John's baptizing in water. Jesus baptizes in the, in the Holy Spirit or with the Holy Spirit. Now, grammatically, this could be understood in two ways. One, John could be saying that he's using water, but Jesus won't use water at all. He'll use the Holy Spirit instead of water. Grammatically, it could be taken that way. And some have, of course, used it to make the argument that, look, when we believe in Jesus Christ and, and accept him into our hearts, we don't need to be baptized in water but he'll just baptize us in, in the Holy Spirit. That's what many use this to say, that the major difference between the baptisms is that one involved water and the other doesn't. However, grammatically, it could also mean John was 
only using water, whereas Jesus would use both water and the Holy Spirit. In other words, Jesus wouldn't merely be baptizing in water, but would baptize with the Holy Spirit as well. So a, a, pr a principle of biblical interpretation is that any time you have a passage that can mean two different things grammatically, we have to bring in other passages that can help us out. And this one's actually very easy to deal with. If you go to Acts chapter 8, you remember that Philip is teaching the Ethiopian eunuch that Jesus is the fulfillment of Isaiah 53. And remember in verse 36, they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Now notice Philip's response. His response was not, no, 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 we don't need water. John's baptism needed water, but Jesus's doesn't. He baptizes with the Holy Spirit. That's not how he responded at all. In fact, in verse 38, it says he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he, and he baptized him. So they both went into the water together, and the eunuch is baptized. So what we see is there's a similarity between Jesus' baptism and John's in that they both involve water. We would have to take the second option grammatically here in order to make it harmonize with the rest of Scripture, that Jesus, yes, does baptize with water, but he also does something John the Baptist could not do, and that is baptize with the Holy Spirit as well. So that's one similarity. Let me point out a couple more similarities before we look at the difference. In Acts 2.38, here's another very familiar verse. Peter says, Repent, let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So here we see baptism into Jesus involves repentance, and it results in the forgiveness of sins. We'll now go back to Mark 1 and verse 4. Mark 1 and verse 4. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So John's baptism involved repentance and resulted in forgiveness of sins too. And also it's implied in the text that John's baptism required belief in God, as does Jesus' baptism. So what we see is they both involve water, they both involve repentance, they both involve belief in God, and they both result in the forgiveness of sins. So what is the difference? Well, the difference is the gift of the Holy Spirit. John himself said that. In Mark 1.8, I baptize you with water, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Peter said in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, without going into a whole sermon on the Holy Spirit as I have in the past, remember that the Holy Spirit represents three things in Scripture. It is the life of God, the character of God, and the power of God. Okay, And, of course, it, the Holy Spirit is part of the, the Godhead part of the Trinity, as some would say. Spirit means breath. And so the Spirit of God is God's life force. When God sends us the gift of the Holy Spirit, He breathes new spiritual life into creatures who were spiritually dead. Spirit also refers to character. More so, in the, in the ancient world, they would say that you had a certain kind of spirit in you to describe your character. But we, we do the same today, right? Don't we say, he's a kind-spirited person? Well, the Holy Spirit represents God's holy and righteous character. So when we receive the Holy Spirit as Christians, it's because we've been cleansed and made holy and are dedicating ourselves to pursuing the holiness of God. As Christians, we have a holy character within us. But the Spirit is also God's power. I have actually preached two lessons on the Holy Spirit. I preached on the Holy Spirit, the life of God, but also the character of God. But what I've not done, and I plan to do soon, is a lesson on how the Holy Spirit is the, the power uh, of God as well. That really completes the picture 
of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. Now, let me just give you a couple points about God's power through the Spirit. The Bible teaches that it was by the power of God's Spirit, by the breath of His mouth, that He created the entire world. Furthermore, in the Old Testament, He sent His Holy Spirit to give the Israelites slaves the miraculous ability to build the tabernacle. You know, you read the, the beautiful description of the tabernacle and all that tapestry and all that incredible artistry, and you think, how could, how could these slaves who've been in Egypt for 430 years make a tabernacle like that? Well, God sent His Spirit to give them the miraculous ability and power to perform what needed to be performed to build that temple. Remember in the judges, whenever a judge or maybe a mighty man of the Lord would go out and defeat an entire army by himself, it would say that the Spirit of the Lord had come upon him before that happened. And of course, in the New Testament, the power of the Holy Spirit was manifest by miracles and signs and wonders and by the transformation of sinners' lives by the power of God's Word and by the power to raise our bodies from the dead when Christ returns. This means, folks, when we're baptized into Christ, we now have spiritual life and we can have the character of God and we're given the power to overcome Satan in our lives and ultimately the power to be resurrected to eternal life in the end. But there's a natural question that arises at this point. That is, if... John's baptism already offered forgiveness of sins. Why would people need to be baptized into Christ if they are already forgiven in John's baptism? Well, a lot of places we could go for this in Leviticus, but in Leviticus 5.16, for instance, is just an example. When somebody brought a guilt offering to the priest, they would bring a ram without defect and they would offer it there. It's talking about an animal sacrifice. It said that their sin would be forgiven them. All throughout the Old Testament, it says that you can be forgiven by offering those animal sacrifices. And so that would lead to a question, if you could be forgiven by animal sacrifices, well then, why did anybody need to go get baptized into John's baptism for forgiveness of sins? Couldn't they just say, well, no, we're good. I'll just offer some animals. Here's, here's really the answer. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, verses 1 through 4. So we're wondering... And we're asking this question, if John's baptism provided forgiveness of sins, well, why would they need to go and be baptized into Christ? Well, look what Hebrews 10 verses 1 through 4 says about the Old Testament animal sacrifices. It says, For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. See, the truth is, there was never any power in animal blood to take away sins. Yes, God told them, if you offer these sacrifices in faith... I'll forgive you, but forgiveness was never made possible by those animals. Likewise, there was no power in the water of John's baptism to take away sins either. You might read into verse 4, it is impossible for the water of John's baptism to take away sins. It's a similar application. Because neither animal sacrifices nor John's baptism were ever the basis for our salvation, the basis of our forgiveness. Verse 10 tells us the basis. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The true basis of forgiveness was always the blood of Christ offered on our behalf. God knew that before it ever happened. God knew that before He ever created the world. The only reason God could accept 
animal sacrifices out of, was out of His mercy and out of His foreknowledge that one day Jesus would come take care of the sin problem forever. That's also the only reason God could accept people being baptized by John for the forgiveness of sins. Before Jesus died for our sins, you see, God has always required different things from different generations of people in order to be saved. But the one thing in common that he has always required across generations is faith. And so Noah's sins, think about Noah back in Genesis. His sins were forgiven, not by being baptized into Christ because Christ had not come yet, but because he had enough faith to build an ark to save his family and to live by faith on the earth. Abraham's sins were forgiven not by being baptized into Christ because Christ had not come yet, but because he had enough faith to go where God told him to be willing to sacrifice his own son and again to live a, a whole life of faith in this God. The Israelites under Moses had their sins forgiven not by being baptized into Christ because Christ had not come yet, but because of their faith that if we bring these animal sacrifices and present them to God, he will forgive us because he said he would. And likewise, the Jews in John the Baptist's day had their sins forgiven, not by being baptized into Christ because Christ had not died for sins yet, but because of their faith that, look, if I go out to some body of water, to Jordan River or wherever, in repentance, and I get immersed in that water, God tells me through John the Baptist, I'll have forgiveness of sins. But none of those things before Christ before Christ died and rose, were the basis of salvation. You see, the ark didn't save Noah. He was saved by faith in the God who would one day send Jesus to die for Noah's sins. Abraham wasn't saved by being willing to sacrifice his son Isaac for God. He was saved by faith in the God who would one day send his son and sacrifice him for Abraham. The Israelites weren't saved by animal sacrifices, but by faith and the God who would one day send His Son as the ultimate animal sacrifice, the perfect Lamb of God, to die for them. And likewise, the people baptized by John the Baptist were not saved by water, but by faith in the God who was about to send the Savior, of whom John was the forerunner. But once Jesus came and died for our sins, all of a sudden it became completely useless and pointless to try to go back to offering animal sacrifices to get forgiveness of sins. It became completely pointless and useless to go back and try to build an ark like Noah did for the forgiveness of sins or to take your son up on a mountain and try to get forgiveness that way or to live under the law of Moses or even to be baptized into John's baptism because all of those things were just precursors leading up to Christ, the one in whom salvation and forgiveness has always been rooted in. That's why I believe the, the gift of the Holy Spirit is connected with baptism into Christ. It's to show just how special our relationship with Christ really is. People didn't receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when they offered animal sacrifices. People didn't receive the gift of the Holy Spirit when they were baptized into John's baptism. It's only connected with baptism into Christ because a relationship with Christ is far superior to any spiritual blessing of the, any of the previous ages. Even Peter says in 1 Peter 1 that the prophets and the angels long to look into the glory of this relationship in Christ that we have now. In Christ, we finally find true spiritual life, rejuvenation, resurrection, both now presently spiritual resurrection, but then in the future, a physical resurrection as our bodies are raised in the end. We can be cleansed of our sins. We can have the holy character of God in us. And it's also why there are all kinds of other images attached to Jesus' baptism that were not attached to John's baptism. Images like death, burial, and resurrection in Romans 6. Images like spiritual circumcision in Colossians 2, or clothing ourselves with Christ in Galatians 3. Hopefully you're still in Hebrews. Look in Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. Now stay with me because this is the first time I've used this verse to make this application, but I believe this is very fair 
In Hebrews 9, he's contrasting the Old Testament ordinances with the true salvation and forgiveness that we can have in Christ. And I'm actually going to start um, partway through verse 9. He says, Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worshiper perfect in conscience, since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. Now, again, in context, I realize he's mainly talking about the law of Moses ordinances, the sacrifices, but also the, the washings and, under the law. But I would argue that John's baptism also fits under the category of various washings. God offered forgiveness through John's baptism, just like he did through those Old Testament ordinances of old, but true forgiveness and cleansing were never found there, only, only in Christ. John's baptism was just as powerless and empty to take away sins as the various ceremonial washings of the Old Testament. Only the sacrifice of Jesus can truly cleanse our consciences. Peter makes the same point in 1 Peter 3.21 when he says, Baptism now saves you, not the removal of the dirt from the flesh. In other words, it's not just an external Jewish washing, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In other words, that, that good conscience is only possible because of what Jesus did through his resurrection. I want to be clear John's, John's baptism was not in the law of Moses, but it was under the era of the law in the first century before Christ died and rose again. And I'll tell you one last passage here on this point. In John 3, John understood all of this. He knew exactly where real salvation was found. And so look what he says in John 3. This is John the Baptist speaking. He's talking about Jesus. He says, For he, John 3, verse 34, For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Ultimately, John's baptism, just like everything else under the law of Moses' era, was a tutor to lead us to Christ, to prepare people to understand who Jesus is. And John was trying to get people to see, if you want to be truly prepared for the Messiah, you have to prepare your hearts to change. You have to be willing to, to repent. And that change was ultimately made possible and the Holy Spirit available to all of those who were baptized into Christ. So it leads to the second part of that question. Were those baptized by John rebaptized into Christ at Pentecost? Now, hopefully that answer is obvious at this point after what we've, all, uh, after what we've seen. But the answer is absolutely and even though we're not told that explicitly, there are three major clues in Acts. For one, in Acts 2.38, remember he said, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Think about what Peter could have said. Couldn't Peter have said, Look, I realize there are a ton of you who have been baptized by John, and you've already repented. But if you're here, and you weren't baptized by John, could you raise your hand and, and bring you over to the side, because you're the ones that need to repent and be baptized into Jesus. He doesn't say that. There would have been tons of people there who were baptized by John. But Peter says, each and every one of you are to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Not every one of you except those who have been baptized by John. Secondly, Acts chapter 18. I'm speeding along here uh, for time's sake, but you remember Apollos? He was a man mighty in scriptures, and he knew the Lord. He understood Jesus' teachings, but apparently, and that's another good question for the Q&A box, how come Apollos 
hadn't heard about the baptism of Jesus. I don't know if he just avoided Jerusalem and didn't go to Pentecost or whatever, but he didn't know about what the apostles taught about the baptism of Jesus. And he was still teaching people about the baptism of John. And Aquila and Priscilla take him aside and they explain to him more accurately. And they're gentle with him because John, John's baptism was a good thing. It was something God, God commanded. It was, it was good, but it was obsolete now. Didn't need it anymore. And then the greatest example is in Acts 19, when Paul is in Ephesus, and he runs into some people, and look what he says. He said to them, verse 2, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, No, we've not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them and began speaking with tongues and prophesying. I believe in verse 5, that's when they would receive the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, like all Christians do. But then in verse 6, Paul lays his hands on them and gives them a special measure, a miraculous measure of the Spirit so that the world would see this visible manifestation of the Holy Spirit's being poured out. You have to see that all of the spiritual gifts in the first century, they were all meant to be visible confirmation that Jesus really has sent the Holy Spirit, that salvation really has been made available to all mankind. You couldn't just walk around and claim that. Yeah, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. You just have to take our word for it. Well, no. They had these miraculous gifts to show the world this is what it was all about. And by the way, that was prophesied about many times in the Old Testament. And that didn't happen with John's baptism because his baptism was simply to point to him who is greater. And there's a bonus here with this question. By the way, the last two questions are much shorter than this one. Um, but there's a bonus because I know you were wondering, <laughs> what about the apostles? Because the apostles were a little different, right? Because they were baptized by John, but then they had the Holy Spirit poured out on them directly at the beginning of Acts 2, even before Peter's sermon. So the question is, were they baptized in water into Christ even after they received the Holy Spirit directly? And Acts 10 tells us the answer to that in an indirect way. But of course, Acts 10, you remember, the Holy Spirit comes on Cornelius and his entire household. And in verse 47, Peter, Peter says, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they asked him to stay on for a few days. Peter actually says that Cornelius and his household had the same thing happen to them that happened to the apostles. The Holy Spirit came on them as they did on us at the beginning, and then he orders them to get baptized in water in the name of Jesus Christ. Because I think it's perfectly reasonable to take that to mean the apostles were baptized in... I didn't mean to click that far. <clears throat> but it's perfectly reasonable to take that to mean the apostles were baptized into Christ in water on Pentecost too. It doesn't make sense that they would do something completely different with Cornelius if the same thing happened to them at the, at the start. Second question. Since Jesus was one with the Trinity, or the Godhead, as is referred to in Scripture, why do we read in Mark that he saw the Spirit descending on him? Was he separated? This is the second part of the question. Was he separated from the Spirit just as he was separated from his Father while on the earth? Let's tackle that in two parts. First of all, why did the Spirit descend on Jesus if he's a part of the Trinity? Look in Mark 1, please. In Mark 1, verses 9 through 11, this is where this account takes place in Mark's Gospel. In those days, verse 9, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was, in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit, like a dove, descending upon him and a voice came out of the heavens, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. Verse 11, combined with a couple verses in the Old Testament, give us the answer to this question. It was to show God's approval of Jesus as his son and as the prophesied Messiah. 
There's a connection in the New Testament between God sending the Holy Spirit on somebody and him showing approval of them. You think about the apostles. Why did they have the Holy Spirit sent on them directly in Acts 2? To show God's approval and Jesus' approval that these are my ambassadors. These are my messengers. Why was Cornelius baptized directly or, or at least have the Holy Spirit come upon them directly in Acts 10? To show God's approval on the Gentiles that salvation was now available to them. Likewise, God sends the Spirit upon Jesus to show his approval. And he states it very plainly when he says, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Or in other words, in whom I approve. But I would also suggest in doing this, God was showing that he was approved to be the Savior of promise. This was an anointing of Jesus for the mission that he was sent to accomplish. I'll just show you a couple verses in Isaiah. In Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2, he talks about this righteous branch who would, who would be a descendant of David, a descendant of, of Jesse. And in Isaiah 11, verses 1 and 2, it says, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And if you look in Isaiah 61, verse 1, it says the spirit, of, this is the, the servant of the Lord speaking, says the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. You remember this is the exact passage Jesus reads from in the synagogue in Luke chapter 4. And when he's done reading, it was so quiet you could hear a pin drop and everybody was just filled with wonder that he was the fulfillment. He said, today, this scripture in Isaiah 61 is fulfilled in your hearing. The Spirit being sent down to Jesus was a very visual way, in the form of a dove, to prove that He was the Chosen One. He was the Messiah sent from God. And we see this most clearly in John chapter 1. Because even though John and Jesus were cousins, John still didn't really get it fully. He knew there was a Savior coming, but he wasn't really sure who it was going to be until this happened, until he saw the Holy Spirit descend on him. Look in John 1, 32-34. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and He remained upon Him. I did not recognize Him, but He who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon Him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit." I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. This was a witness to prove that Jesus was indeed the Son of God, the one who had come to pour out the Spirit that had been prophesied about in the Old Testament and provide salvation for all mankind. That's why the Spirit descended upon him. Now, a little bit harder question, which means it's a shorter answer. <laughs> was Jesus separated from the Spirit? like he was from the Father. Well, I'll go with Adam. I'll be like Adam this morning. Yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. We make a mistake. We make a mistake when we try to get too spatial and geographical in our understanding of God. You know, the Bible speaks of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of being one God, part of this Trinity, if you will. That's not really a biblical word, but it is a biblical concept, Trinity, or the Godhead, okay, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're said to be one, part of the same Godhead, but there's also scriptures that say that they're separate and they're different. So, for instance, in Colossians 2 and verse 9 says, In Jesus all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. That means that all of deity is in Jesus Christ in his body on the earth. So it's not just Jesus, but it's also the Father and the Spirit within Jesus Remember, Isaiah 11 said that the Spirit of God would rest upon him. He, he would have the Spirit of God in him, the Spirit of righteousness and, and wisdom. 
In John 14 and verse 10, Jesus says, Don't you know that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? He speaks very much about the oneness many times in Scripture. This is a couple examples. But then it gets messy because there are other instances where it seems that they're separate, as in when Jesus goes off by himself on a mountain and prays to the Father. Well, he doesn't just talk to himself. He's actually talking to his Father in heaven. Or when Jesus is on the cross and he said to his Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So was the Holy Spirit with Jesus but not with the Father? And then when Jesus died, does the Spirit return to the Father? Um, It gets confusing because then people say, well, no, that's not the Holy Spirit when he says he's committing his spirit to God. Maybe that's just his breath. It's just his, his life. Okay, well, are we saying that that Jesus didn't have the Holy Spirit of God until he was 30 years old when the Spirit descended on him like a dove? Are we prepared to say that? And when the Spirit descended on Jesus as a dove, did the Spirit leave the Father in heaven and come down and now he's with Jesus until Jesus dies and then it goes back to the Father? You see what happens is it gets very jumbled and we get confused. John 4 says God is Spirit. Hey, and that's really the problem. We, we're flesh and blood, and I'll tell you, they're one, but they're also separate in person and roles. And that's just strange for us because we're, we're flesh and blood, right? We're, we live in a material world. We have our boxes that we like to put things in, and it's very difficult to put God in boxes. And I'll tell you, if I preached a whole sermon or even a whole series of sermons on this topic, it wouldn't answer all of our questions hard to fully comprehend the dynamic between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, especially when we start to get into locations of where they're at 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 what time, because they're just not bound by the same limits that we are. So a great question, and I wish I could give a better answer than that, um, but that's really all we have to work with. And third and finally tonight, where was the Garden of Eden located? This is easy, too. We have no idea. (laughs) Take out your songbooks, and we will stand it. No. Uh, Let me me give you at least some explanation for all this hard work I went through to say that. Uh, (laughs) Look in Genesis 2. Genesis 2. Because we have some geographical markers, and people just are flabbergasted by that. How can we not know? I mean, Genesis 2 tells us what's going on geographically. And it says in Genesis 2, verse 10, beginning, that a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is um, Pishon. It flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good, and the Dedelim and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It flows east of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. So the description of the garden tells us that a river flowed out of Eden, which then branched off into four different rivers. The problem is, when you look at a map, not only a modern day map, but even a map of Bible times, there is no such place on the map. You cannot find a place. You can find the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And when you trace those back to where they start, there aren't two other rivers that start in the same place. And so some people say, well, it's the Tigris and Euphrates river, so it must be in modern day Iraq, since that's kind of where they they come together. But they're ignoring something very, very important. And that is the flood. Let's just round off and say that the earth was flooded for an entire year. That's that's pretty close. The earth was flooded, took, took an entire year for the water to come back down to ground level. Here's my question. Do you think when the water settled back down after a year that the topography of the earth and all the rivers before the flood would look exactly the same and be in the exact same place? There's no way. 
No way. The earth after the flood would look totally different than before the flood. Rivers and oceans and lakes would, they would not be the same. There was massive calamity and shifts in entire continents. Some even go so far, I'm not sure I'm willing to go this far, it's an interesting thought. Some even go so far as to argue there were no continents before the flood. But some wonder, okay, well, how come the Tigris and Euphrates are, are mentioned in our modern-day maps and in Genesis 2, but they're different? Well, imagine you're Noah after the flood. You and your family are the only ones who have survived on the earth. When you started renaming rivers and mountains and bodies of water, wouldn't you pull from previous names that you already knew about? That happens all the time. When people settle in new lands, they often take the names of towns and they reproduce them in the country or the continent or wherever they're at that they migrated to. Noah and his family likely knew the names of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and they probably gave those names to two rivers after the flood. But it doesn't mean that those were the exact same rivers in the pre-flood world of Genesis 2. That's why our modern day maps, we can still still see Tigris and Euphrates, but they don't match the description of the rivers in Genesis 2. It's because they're not the same. The Genesis 2 rivers were lost in the flood. And let me suggest this as we close. Perhaps there is a deeper significance to that. The Hebrew writer makes a point about the great significance that the Ark of the Covenant was gone, and the Jews lost that. They have no idea where the Ark of the Covenant is. The Hebrew writer makes a point about that. I wonder if there's a point that God made sure with the flood it was impossible for man to find his way back to the tree of life in the presence of God on his own. What the Bible reveals is that Jesus is the only one who can show us the way back home to paradise with God. He says in John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. And the Bible closes in Revelation 22 with this beautiful scene, this heavenly picture, and it's described just like the Garden of Eden. And there are rivers there flowing from the throne of God. And there is the tree of life right there in God's presence. That's the story of the Bible. If you want to come back home to Him, you've got to do it through Jesus. And you can do that. We're going to sing a song in a moment encouraging you to believe in Jesus, to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins so that you can find your way back home to Him. And if you've put on Christ in baptism and you've wandered off and you need our prayers, you need our help in any way. We love you. We're here to help you. We're here to pray for you. And make sure that you find the garden in the end, that you come home to God in the end. Can we help you in any way? Come forward and let us know while we stand and sing.